Welcome to episode 23 of the Evergreen Thumb. My guest today is Cassie Chihorse, and Cassie is an outreach and education specialist with the Washington State Department of Agriculture, and she is here today to talk to us about unwelcome guests in the garden. Specifically, we're going to talk mostly about Japanese beetles, but also we'll touch on the uh, northern giant hornet and what to look for, what to do uh, if these show up in your garden. Before I get to my discussion with Cassie, it's time for the June gardening calendar. So for planning, it's time to construct trellises for tomatoes, cucumbers, whole beans, and similar vining plants, including ornamental vines, uh, to make sure they have a non nice, strong structure to grow on for the growing season. In maintenance, it's time to prune lilacs, forsythia, rhododendrons, and similar plants after they're done blooming. You can fertilize the vegetable garden about a month after plants emerge by applying a top dressing or a side dressing in the vegetable rows. You can get an early crop by thinning from new plantings of lettuce, chard, onions, and similar crops. Be sure to pick ripe strawberries regularly to avoid diseases caused by rotting fruit. Use organic mulches to conserve soil moisture in garden beds. An inch or two of bark or composted leaves or even straw will help minimize the loss of water through evaporation. Uh, after normal fruit drop of crops like apples, pears, and peaches, make sure to clean up that dropped fruit to help prevent the spread of disease, but also consider thinning the remaining fruit to produce a crop of larger fruit. Be sure that you are watering su sufficiently and regularly enough to avoid drought stress. This is best achieved by checking the moisture level in the soil on a routine basis because the water needs are going to vary depending on environmental conditions. In higher elevations, um, frost may still be a concern during cold nights, so be sure to protect your young vegetables by having a row cover or use season extenders such as water jugs or water walls and um, other heat sinks to help protect tender plants. Uh, in planting and propagation, it is a good time to plant dahlias and gladioli for the late summer blossoms. You can also do some succession planting of vegetable crops like uh, root crops. Uh, it's best to wait for a succession of cooler season vegetables like lettuce or peas until you get into uh, early fall. Again, uh, same as last month, continue to manage weeds while they're small and actively growing so that the, seed, the weed does not get established because it makes the weeds much harder to manage. Learn to identify beneficial insects and plant some insectary plants to encourage them in your garden. Some of those plants could be alyssum, phacelia, sunflowers, candy tuft, yarrow, dill, um, these will attract beneficial insects into your garden. Monitor azaleas, rhododendrons, and other broadleaf ornamentals for adult root weevils. Look for fresh evidence of feeding, which is notching on the edges of leaves. And you can try sticky trap products on plant trunks to trap adult weevils, but protect against damaging the bark of the plants by applying the, trap, the sticky material over a band of burlap or similar breathable uh, material wrapped around the trunk. If you find evidence of root weevil levels, mark those plants now and come back and treat with beneficial nematodes when soil temperatures are above 55 degrees Fahrenheit. If root weevils are a consistent problem, consider removing the plant and choosing a more resistant variety. Continue to monitor blueberry, strawberry, cherry, and other soft fruits for spotted wing drosophila. If you find these pests present, use an integrated pest management approach and begin with the least toxic methods to manage the pests. I will put a link in the show notes to uh, a resource that will help tell you how to monitor and manage this pest. And finally, 
it's a, uh, when the weather is nice, it's a good time to move house plants outdoors for cleaning, grooming, repotting, and summer growth. That wraps up the June calendar. Now let's get into my conversation with Cassie. All right. Thanks for joining me today, Cassie. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to share some knowledge and teach people about um, some invasive pests. Okay, so um, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your work with the Washington State Department of Agriculture? Yeah, so my name is Cassie Chewers. I work for the Washington State Department of Agriculture. I am an outreach specialist. So it's basically my job to get information out to the people, let them know what's going on, what's important, and basically how you can help protect like your backyard, the whole state of Washington and our natural resources, agricultural systems all together. Okay. So one of the, the key thing we wanted to talk about today was Japanese beetles. So can you tell us a little bit about them and why there's concern about their presence in Washington? Yeah. So basically the first thing you have to think about is Japanese beetle. It's not from here. Um, it's an invasive species. So when it comes over here, there's a couple different impacts it has to us. Um, and we need to keep those in mind. The problem with Japanese beetles, it comes in a couple different stages. Um, you'll see it as adults in the summer, and then it also lives as a grub or a larvae in the soil. The problem with the adults is that they really don't discriminate. They feed on over 300 different types of plants. Um, so this will be buds of flowers, anything that's green and leafy. What they do is they skeletonize the leaves, it causes damage. Um, some plants, you know, are sus aren't as susceptible to some feeding and will grow back, but after um, repeated defoliation and repeated response, they will die. Then when you flip over to the other side and you have um, grubs or larvae, they actually live in the soil in pretty much our grassy areas. Um, they like ornamental vegetation, so think your turf. That's going to be your front yard, your backyard, your um, church, playground, school, um, and those big recreational grassy areas are gonna could be impacted from the grub larva. What they do is they move around in the soil and eat, they eat the grass roots. So there'll be yellow patches or in really intense cases, um, they can eat all those roots off. It can lift up like dead carpet, um, but it'll cause destruction to that system even more as well. Okay, so aside from grasses, what are some of the more susceptible plants yeah, so when they switch into the adults, right, they feed on over 300 different types of plants. So there isn't a much out of their wheelhouse. Um, essentially, if it's green and leafy or if it's a flower, they love roses. Um, so I know that's kind of a bummer for a bunch of gardeners. Um, if you have flowers around your house, kind of that ornamental vegetation will get into. Some of our agricultural things, um, hops would be susceptible, grapes, um, your trees and your bushes and things that are growing from your garden, the adults can feast on their leaves too. Um, buds of flowers, uh, fruit trees is also potentially there. Okay, so this could have could have large impacts on a lot of our primary agricultural crops in Washington. Yeah, then. it really doesn't kind of discriminate. So what areas are currently affected by Japanese beetles? So we are finding Japanese beetle right now in lower Yakima Valley. If you get in your car in Yakima and you drive to the Tri-Cities, you might run into Japanese beetle. So in 2020, we picked up three beetles, two in Sunnyside and two in Grandview. Um, the following year in 2021, we went ahead and trapped the area at a massive rate, putting out hundreds of traps to see how many beetles there are and where. And they're pretty much in the Grandview area. Um, the following year, you know, we did catch beetles again in the Grandview area, but they were starting to spread a little bit into Sunnyside. We found some in Wapato, and then coming into this year, it's kind of the same thing. Wapato, Sunnyside, Grandview, also down into Mabton. I mean, new this year, or I should say last year, you know, when we were trapping, we found some in Pasco. So it's kind of like that lower valley, um, but... They've already spread that much just in a few years. Yeah, so in the first year that we did the massive trapping, we caught a little over 24,000 beetles um, in that Grandview, Sunnyside kind of mapped in area. Um, since then, that has decreased to be about 18,500 beetles. So it's gone down. 
Um, we're catching less beetles, but there are those outliers for now. We're seeing them in Wapato and unfortunately them in Pasco and a couple more in Prosser um, as well, or getting more towards those towns. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about what Japanese beetles look like and how we can identify them, if, especially if you're in that area? The best way to identify and describe Japanese beetle is people will say, well, that kind of looks like a ladybug, but it's actually quite different. So about the size of your pinky nail, but the, the same general shape that a ladybug would have, right? Um, but it is green and metallic-y um, with copper wing covers. If you look at it like super close, it has a little tuffets of hair on the side and the tip of its abdomen, but that green metallic color with the copper wing covers is going to be a pretty good um, tall tail sign when it's the adult form. And you want to think to look for the adults in the summer, basically anywhere from like mid-May to mid-October. We've started to see them kind of more towards June. Okay. And what about the grubs? What do they look like? Are they a specific color or... The thing about grubs or larvae is they kind of all look the same when they're coming um, out. If, if it's like a tan C-shaped grub, like we would describe the Japanese beetle larvas, it does have like a brown tan head and visible legs, about an eighth of an inch to an inch long. Um, and we'll find it in the soil, but we kind of have to get it underneath the microscope to tell if it exactly is Japanese beetle, especially if it's in an area where you know, it hasn't been picked up before um, because a lot of the beetles that pop out, their grubs kind of look the same. Okay. Um, so how can we help prevent the spread of Japanese beetles from becoming in, um, established in, in our gardens? Yeah. The best thing anybody can do is always be on the lookout for Japanese beetle. If you see it, take a picture and send that picture to WSDA. Right now, there's a couple more things, too, that you can do. Um, since we know that Japanese beetle, you know, is so over in eastern Washington and a couple of those places, we know that it's not in some other places. What WSDA does is we set traps across the state each year to help monitor for them. So you adding your extra set of eyes is another great way to be on the lookout for them. Um, depending on where you live, you know, if you're in an area near Japanese beetle, you might want to get a trap and set it yourself. Um, that'll kind of be your first detector if you have Japanese beetle. Traps come in different shapes and sizes. Um, you can find them online at home and garden stores, um, but they'll, they'll be the first detector, detection to let you know if you have it. Um, they just kind of smell like roses or other beetles because they have a lure at the top. And then it's basically usually a bag or a bucket. The beetle just gets caught in it and dies. We use that method across the state, you know, to see if it's here, if it's not here. And then in those areas where we have caught the beetles, the traps catch the adults. Um, so they're not able to lay as many eggs in the soil. So it also helps kind of keep their numbers down. So if someone does find Japanese beetles in their garden, um, is, is there a way to interrupt their life cycle or are there other control measures that they can use to try to protect their garden? So is there a way to interrupt their life cycle or otherwise control the Japanese beetle if we do find them after we've reported it? So if you report Japanese beetle and it's confirmed to be Japanese beetle, um, there is some tools and resources there for you um, out of the extension office on what you can do. Um, we'll also be a resource, you know, telling you, hey, set a trap. That'll go ahead and pick it up, but you know, you're not going to get into treating or managing for something unless you for sure have it. Um, and we'd also want to be able to get in that area and see if it's somewhere else nearby, if it's spreading and monitor kind of that extent. So are there any known um, predators or uh, parasitoids of Japanese beetles? It's, it's invasive and it's not from here. Um, what happened was it first established in Riverton, New Jersey, um, and since then it's spread about halfway across the United States. Um, we just unfortunately don't have um, it, the amount of predators needed to take care of it. One beetle can drop 40 to 60 eggs, and once they get in, you know, that grassy area, they kind of have that unlimited buffet to really just thrive and live. So it unfortunately does kind of just come up to us. 
um, to be able to go ahead and eradicate and get rid of them. We don't really have the natural predators or things here that can really wipe them out, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there anything else we should know about Japanese beetles? Um, I think it's it'd be nice to know maybe just a little bit more about what WSDA does um, or kind of maybe what's going on with Japanese beetle in the West Side and why it's so important. Right. We all know that um, Washington, we have a big agricultural system. You might have a garden in your backyard, too, but we have lots of jobs. We have lots of money and exports and things like that. Um, what happens is um, it's living kind of in the East Coast, if you ever look at a map. Um, and basically in the 70s, the feds kind of came up with rules and regulations to keep it from spreading. So us Western states, we monitor for it, monitor for it and make sure we don't have it, right? We've actually been trapping in Washington since the 90s. Now that we have Japanese beetle or any of our neighboring states, if they find it, the first thing that we want to do is eradicate um, or we want to quickly get rid of it. And we don't want to let it live here for multiple years so that it's established and we've lost the chance to beat it. Because what could happen is if we turn into a state that becomes infested with Japanese beetle or we have areas of our state that are and we have lost the hope to eradicate them, um, that could go in there for an ex um, effect kind of our exports um, or affect people's ability to move things around in the areas where they live um, because our neighboring states won't want us to give them Japanese beetle. Um, so you know, it's being neighborly and protecting your backyard, but it's also kind of doing the good for all these people that have jobs um, and that kind of that goodwill of our state. Okay. So are there other insects that maybe we should be aware of that uh, and keep an eye out for that are trying to establish in Washington? Yeah. So um, in Washington, a couple of the ones that we always tell you to be on the lookout for is Japanese beetle. Um, we're actually still asking people to keep their eyes and ears peeled. I guess really just your eyes for northern giant hornet. Um, you might have heard it as Asian giant hornet, or you're probably familiar with murder hornet. We haven't seen that much or heard that much lately because we haven't found any hornets or nests in the last two years. Um, but we're still serving and looking for them going into this summer. The third one to really be on the lookout for is spotted lanternfly. This has not made its way to Washington yet, um, but kind of like Japanese beetles started in the East Coast, spotted lanternfly did as well, and it has spread itself all the way to Chicago in about 10 years, um, which is a lot faster than some of the other insects have spread. Um, they travel pretty well, and they have been intercepted dead in some of our neighboring states to the south, um, so we know that they have the chance to get here. Um, so that's another good one to be on the lookout for. And the giant hornets, that was, if I remember right, that was primarily Whatcom County? Yes. So we found um, and removed four nests all from the area of Blaine. We've had multiple sightings um, all in that northwest corner of Whatcom County. We did have one down in Bellingham, but everything's kind of been up in that area. And you just have to remember, you know, if the hornets got over here once, it could have the chance to happen again. So it's always good to have your eyes open. What potential threats uh, does the giant hornet pose in Washington? The giant hornet poses a couple different threats to Washington. Their main threat is that they are huge predators of honeybees. Um, instead of just eating one or two or three insects, um, kind of nabbing a pollinator out of the air, smashing up and eating it, they do go through this phase of their life where they get super hungry and can wreck an entire bee box. Um, those boxes that you see sitting in the field could house 45 to 65,000 happy, healthy bees. And I just need a couple hornets to wipe all those adults out in the matter of 90 minutes. Wow. Um, so that's kind of the huge threat that they would pose to us here in Washington. If we lose our honeybees, um, that's going to affect a lot of things down the chain. Um, there's also the human health factor because no one wants to get stung by them. They do tend to guard their nests. Um, but other than that, they just want to fly around and eat bugs. So we kind of have to um, work a little bit to get stung there. Can you uh, describe the, the giant hornets? I mean, obviously they're 
large compared to other wasps or, or hornets, but what are their distinguishing factors or features? Yeah, so when you look um, for a northern giant hornet, um, it's the world's largest hornet. So that'll be the first thing that kind of strikes out to you. It's between an inch and a half and two inches in length, usually. The second thing you're going to want to kind of look at its head. Um, it's very large and prominent. It's like as big and as wide as its body. And it's typically like bright orange, yellow color. It'd be like me having a pumpkin on my head. You know, our heads just aren't like that. The other thing you kind of can look for is on its abdomen. It has like these black and orange yellow stripe lines. They're kind of horizontal and straight across. So there's not going to be like spots or teardrops. And then the second thing about their nest is that they usually nest in the ground or in tree cavities. Um, so if you see like an open face nest hanging from a tree, it's probably not going to be one of these hornets. But the best thing that you can do is always take a picture, send it to us, and we can do our best to work to figure out what it is. What kind of things can home gardeners do to help prevent the spread of these uh, invasive insects? Some of the things that um, you could do as a gardener, you know, to help prevent the spread of invasive insects is kind of just in general prevent the spread of invasive species. You know, when you're gardening and shopping, if you have the option to plant something that'll give you the same effect as a um, native plant, maybe you go that route. One of the things that I can tell you about spotted lanternfly or some of our other invasive insects that come over is they like to live and thrive on species that are from their origin. So we have a big campaign for people to help identify tree of heaven help us map it and remove it if possible, because spotted lanternfly uses it as its host tree. Other than that, you know, the best thing that you can do is really just keep your eyes open. Half of the invasive species that get reported each year um, come from the general public. You see something and you're like, I'm not sure about that. So you take a picture and you submit it to us. And then, you know, just kind of try to educate yourself and your neighbors. If you heard me share a little bit about Japanese beetle today, tell a friend or two. Um, that really gets us helping to spread the word. So one thing that it just occurred to me that could be an issue too is a consideration is to um, pay attention to where your plant material comes from. Um, you know, if you're buy, if you're get, if you're obtaining plants from somewhere other than a nursery, I'm thinking you know you go on vacation and you bring home you know a start from somebody's garden or something like that. You never know what could be hitchhiking. Yeah, that's very true. That's very important. Um, that's why, we you know, we kind of say buy stuff from a licensed nursery because um, you have to think about Japanese beetle. It got here from the East Coast, um, well, potentially, right? So I told you that those larvae, they live in the soil. Well, in the summer, what the adults are doing is they're eating something above the surface. They're mating. They drop a couple eggs. They go back up and meet, mate again, eat, drop a couple eggs, and they continue that cycle. So if you have a potted plant on the outside of your house, on your front porch, they're eating. That could get some eggs in it. You bring it inside or you move or something, then you bring it back outside, and it's going to hatch out Japanese beetle, and it's going to be in a new area. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add about Japanese beetles or invasive insects in general? The most important takeaway um, when you're thinking about invasive insects, Japanese beetle, northern giant hornet, you know, is if you see something, take a picture and report it. Um, the other thing to really take away is that you do do a lot of good um, in keeping your eyes and ears peeled, especially with like northern giant hornet. We have trapping programs where citizens really get involved and help us monitor in areas that we're not. Um, I know you guys are out in your gardens every day and looking for these things. So it really is cool to see us kind of educating and working together um, for the common good of not just to protect your backyard, but to protect the whole Washington state. So for that, the State Department of Agriculture is pretty thankful, um, especially, you know, if you're just listening in to this podcast, um, you're helping us spread the word. All right. Well, thank you so much, Cassie, for being here and telling us about Japanese beetles. And hopefully we can um, stop them in their tracks. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. The website, if you want to find any information, is agr.wa.gov slash beetles. Okay. And we will put a link to that in the show notes so that it's easy for everybody to find. 